So, uh, <laughs> so last, uh, last speaker of the conference uh, is Bobby Feinberg, and uh, just uh, even though there are no talks in the afternoon, there will be lunch. So, uh, okay. Thank you, sir. Interesting. The microphone says off, but I heard my voice. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, operated by the NSA. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, well, the theme of this talk is sort of the question of is it easy to find proofs of theorems? Is it, uh, as a computational question, that's the P versus NP question, so we believe the answer is no. Uh, so, you can ask the more refined question, what types of proofs are computationally easy to find? this question to proofs of non-existence of solutions to systems of polynomials over the real numbers, which sounds like a very specific type of theorem, but you can actually encode a lot that way. Uh, okay, so special cases, theorems, those start Does not exist an n dimensional vector. Does not, uh, not exist. There's no. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, such that f sub i of x equals 0 for all i, uh, where you know, f1 through fm. polynomials and the variables sex up. Okay, so uh, just to give you a sense that theorems of this form can be interesting, let's try writing uh, graph G does not have a K coloring in this form. There are many wonderful theorems in combinatorics that uh, can be summarized this way for specific values of G and K. Lovas's theorem about the chromatic number of the condenser graph, for example. Uh, I would algebraize this by making variables uh, A sub V C where V is a vertex of the graph, and C is uh, a color in the range 1 through K. And then, uh, okay, so you should think of the, these variables as encoding 1 if I assign color C to the vertex V, and 0 otherwise. I force them to take the value of 0 and run by writing down that constraint. I force every vertex to have a color by writing down that constraint, and I force every edge to be properly colored. By writing down one of those constraints for every edge of the graph. Okay, in this way I've encoded uh, non-existence of k-coloring as a system of polynomial equations in some real variables. Okay, so that tells you right away, since, since k colorability is NP hard, that tells you right away that uh, deciding the existence or non existence of solutions of polynomial equations is uh, at least NP hard. Um, another example that might be appealing to this audience, just to show that even if you don't care about computer science discrete math type questions, uh, you know, do there exist 100,000 points, uh, we call that N, in the plane with less than uh, 20,000 
snake distances. Oh, the yeah, capital K means thousands. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I tried to choose my parameters in the range where the ratio of these numbers is between log n and root log n, so that this is still in the realm where we don't know the answer to this question. Uh, although I don't know what the constant factors are, and uh, the constants are much bigger. Now. Okay. This is at least potentially a, a question that's not resolved either by Yerdish's uh, upper bound or Goose and Katz's lower bound. Okay, uh, so we can encode the coordinates of our points as x1, y1 through xn, yn. Uh, I can enforce that, okay, so, so this line will be variables. I can enforce that the points are all distinct by saying that uh, xi minus xj squared plus yi minus yj squared is 1 plus z di j squared for all i not equal to j. This doesn't just make the points distinct, it makes them all at least one distance apart, but uh, if there's any solution to this, then you can scale it so that the distances are all greater than one. Um, now I have to enforce that the number of distinct distances is no greater than little k, so... Uh, okay. On that line, I created a bunch of variables zij, so now I'll create another set of variables d1 through dk representing the distances. And then I'll say that the products from L equals 1 to K of the squared distance between point I and J minus DL squared is equal to 0. Why is this 1 plus? Oh, I defined the squared distance on this line to be 1 plus ZIJ squared. Uh, so now I've done it. Here's a system of polynomial equations. Uh, in, I guess I started out with 200,000 variables, but now that I did one for every ordered pair, we've got 200,000 choose two variables. Uh, and if you could decide whether there is a solution to these equations, you would know the answer to this uh, special case of the distinctness. Uh, okay. Is it because this is a NP complete? You you could say that uh, that you can kind of uh, formulate something like this for every problem in NP or something. Uh, yes. So every every problem in NP can be encoded this way. Right. Yeah. And also, you know, like uh, any theorem you care about, the question whether it has a proof of length less than n bits in ZFC can be encoded in a very complicated way. Yes, yeah, an NP question. Okay, so it's not quite the case that the Riemann hypothesis can be represented as whether, whether some system of polynomials has a satisfying assignment, but the question of whether there's a proof of the Riemann hypothesis that fits in uh, you know, less than 200 volumes uh, when written in ASCII, if you just encode that as some very large but still polynomial in the length of the proof statement about satisfying uh, polynomial equations over the real number. Okay, so uh, this problem is not known to be in NP. No, it could mean that NP equals 20. Oh, no, the question, the question is whether this problem belongs in NP. Uh, do you know the answer to that? Not exist. It's not. <laughs> no. uh, well, so there's this Ryan O'Donnell paper that says that there are, you can find systems of polynomial equations with small coefficients, so the two where the only satisfying I, assignment um, requires a huge number of bits to write down. Right. Okay. There the, the are two questions, uh, separate question. One is, uh, do we, is it like non-existence versus existence? Is it like issue of NP versus <coughs> NP? And the, the other thing is well, issues of numerical accuracy. Right. 
as stated. Well, of course, it may be on 20 even if it is true. You cannot represent yeah. yeah. like this, right? Because of some other. Right, so, but, no, so, but I think for starters, this thing is not in NP because of this thing that he. he, he Oh, like a square root sum. This problem. is just for every. That, no, this is just for every kind of statement, right? Uh, not existence. Is it for every? Oh, like, oh, okay. It's like coin be complete. Yeah, yes. No, no, okay. 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 So is it in? So is it in coding? No. That's, that's, say these integer coefficients. <laughs> and the length that you're encoding is the yes. number of bits that it takes out to write down all the equations. Uh, Normally, if this was in NP, then NP would be the first one. No, okay. Uh, no, 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 no,
Sooner or later, someone will find it in a notebook of Gauss, and then we can stop attributing it to these people. Uh, uh, For a fixed bound on the degree of the reputation that you're searching for, uh, one can find a sum of squares reputation of degree d by solving a semi definite program. Uh, of size n to the big O of D. D is the maximum degree of participation. Uh, D is the maximum degree. That's right. So D is maximum of degree Fi plus degree Hi or 2 times degree of Gj. For the polynomial participating in the proof. And uh, semi definite programming has algorithms that run in time polynomial in the size of the semi definite program. So for, uh, for systems of polynomials that have constant degree positive shell and such reputations, we can actually automate the process of finding them. By the way, it's not obvious from the way I wrote it down here, but um, one way of thinking about uh, applying the positive shell and proof system. It's sort of a glorified form of proving stuff by manipulating Cauchy Schwartz inequalities. And uh, one of the things I've been noticing sitting in the audience this week is that a lot of the talks have been a testament to the awesome power of Cauchy Schwartz. There are, of course, very many other techniques that are getting applied, but um, you can really prove a lot by manipulating Cauchy Schwartz in clever ways, and often ways that take a lot of ingenuity to come up with. Uh, and okay, so this is saying, rather than ingenuity, if you have a powerful semi-definite program solver, then uh, you can get away with not using ingenuity, but just plugging in the polynomials that you want to refute and letting the solver grow. Can you show what you mentioned how this problem is uh, I won't write on the board to answer that question, but I will hand wave. Um, so what was the question? Can I show how uh, searching for uh, reputation amounts to solving a semi-definite program? Um, okay, so the semi-definite matrix that you search for in this SDP will be the coefficient matrix of this polynomial, the sum of gj squared. Uh, in other words, rows and columns will be indexed by monomials of degree at most d over 2. And in the uh, alpha beta entry, I'll put the coefficient of x to the alpha, x to the beta in this polynomial. So, yeah, maybe, maybe one simple way to see, just to, to get an intuition, is just if you look at two refutations and you take their convex combination, it's still a refutation. Uh, so, like, if you look at a set, a vector of h1 till hm and g1 till g whatever, and uh, and uh, take the convex combination, it's still a refutation. So that at least show that this is a, a convex set, and it turns out to be like a convex uh, SDP code. So the only feasible partial problem, no object function. It's a feasibility problem. Yes, that's right. Okay, so this proof system seems quite powerful, and uh, you know, because we can computationally automate the process of finding low degree sum of squares proofs, it becomes important from a complexity theory standpoint to understand which theorems are hard to prove in this way. If my theorem 
includes in its statement a high degree polynomial. If one of the fi has super constant degree, uh, then by definition you cannot have a constant degree sum of squares reputation of it. One short question. Yes. The theorem, if, uh, if you look at it, does it give any bounds what uh, degree should be if you tell me you have? Uh, you mean this one? <laughs> this one, yeah. Uh, I do not know whether the, the Praveen-Stengel result in full generality has an effective bound. Um, for problems where the variables are constrained to be Boolean, so you have an xi equals xi squared constraint, then you can bound the degree of the reputation above by uh, big O of the number of variables. In fact, exactly the number of variables. Uh, so, good question. Uh, so for the, for the usual notion, that's it's the product of the degrees, right? So that's... So, so here you don't have something like that. It doesn't, it's not as bad. It's much worse. Uh, so, so oh. oh, if it's Boolean, then it's the <coughs> thing, but if it's not Boolean, there's no... But it can't be better than Nurstein. It can't be better than Nurstein. Right. Okay. So you cannot get, a, uh, you cannot get even something finite out of finite number of finite degree polynomials. There's no a priority problem. Uh, okay, so, so, so there's this sort of trivial example that your polynomials have a high degree, but um, there are also interesting examples where the statement of the result only involves low degree polynomials, but we know that there's no low degree sum of squares proof. Let me give you some examples. Well, maybe you should say that you can always call it the, uh, any empty statement as constant degree polynomials. It's not a big loss. Yes, that's right, that's right. If you have, I, 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 thanks, Avi, I should have said that. Uh, right, if you have some monomial which is high degree, um, you know, x to the 100, you just make new variables, uh, you know, x sub 2, which is asserted by one of the equations to be equal to x squared, and then x sub 3, which is equal to x times x sub 2, uh, and so on. Okay, you make 100 new variables and you get something that encodes uh, x to 100 and you never went above degree 2. Uh, okay, let me write down some theorems that involve only degree two, uh, 2 or 3 polynomials and don't have any low degree proofs. Uh, the first one is a sum of natural numbers. natural number. Okay, so uh, uh, this says that if I have variables xi, each of which is equal to xi squared, and summation of xi is equal to r, has no solutions when r is not a natural number. And unfortunately, uh, this requires a degree bounded below by a constant times r. So for example, if you want to solve a knapsack problem where uh, you have items of size 1, you have a knapsack with capacity 100.5, and you want to fit as many items in the knapsack as possible. Uh, obviously, you can't fit more than 100 items in, but the sum of squares proof system is incapable of refuting the claim that you managed to fit 100.5. Uh, maybe you should give credit to Gregory for four This is, uh, yes, thanks, Abby. The knapsack is not solvable. Yeah, the statement of the... <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, uh, second example. Can you go and just like putting in the back like try to squeeze more? Uh, this one is also Gregorio. Yeah. Bobby, sorry. Why uh, xi equals xi squared? Natural numbers do not have to satisfy. Uh, no. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right, that's right. This uh, this is a corollary of the yeah. yeah. um, Okay, this one is also Gregoriev uh, that exists. Uh, systems of M equations, uh, linear equations over F 
two in n variables. Uh, such that they have no satisfying, no, no assignment satisfies more than half plus epsilon fraction of the equations. You can encode these F2-valued variables as plus minus ones. So then an equation that says, for example, that the sum of three variables mod two is zero or one. Uh, can be written as x i x j x k is equal to plus minus one. Uh, okay, this requires sum of squares degree uh, at least a constant times n. And the system only involves like every every equation involves at most three variables. Uh, that's right. That's right. The, the system asserted in the theorem has only three variables per linear equation. That's what makes the encoding have uh, low degree polynomials. Uh, the proof of this result, which I'm not going to give, uh, is an application of the probabilistic method. I'm also not going to give a proof of the knapsack result, but my hope is that by the end of this talk, you'll have some notion of how the knapsack result is proved. So, so the, the proof of the statement is the probabilistic method, or the proof of that there's no refutation? Uh, the proof of existence of such systems is the probabilistic method. Um, <coughs> if the, uh, the, the proof says that if the constraint graph of the system of equations has a particular expansion property that is satisfied when you sample random systems of equations, uh, then it's impossible to refute uh, this system of equations in low degree sum of squares. So that's the first part. Uh, then you also need to know that no assignment, oh, and, and that part can be made explicit. You just need a graph with a certain expansion of properties, constructed, explicit constructions of such graphs are known. But you also need to set the right hand sides of the equations in such a way that no assignment satisfies more than half plus epsilon fraction of them. And for that, you just do a random assignment, and nobody knows how to do an explicit assignment that makes them robustly unsatisfiable. So, so that's the part that really relies heavily on the probability um, method. Okay, so uh, there's some very nice other. Examples, but I can't resist telling you one more. Um, it, for, for the original uh, introduction of this example is a paper by Mecca, Potechen, and Vigdorsen. Uh, the, the lower bound was sort of uh, polished to perfection. Uh, by Balaz Barak and five other authors. Um, so GN one half has no clique uh, bigger than or log n. That of course is due to Erdős. Sum of squares of degree d cannot refute the existence of 
an n to the one half minus A clique whose size is almost square root of n, where the deficiency from square root of n uh, uh, tends to zero with n, but in a way that depends on the degree of the sum of squares reputation, such that when you get up to about degree log n, this is actually saying nothing about an ability to um, repeat cliques. Uh, okay. This again, the well, there's a lot to say, uh, which I'm not going to say, and I don't, to be honest with you, understand about how the lower bound on sum of squares degree is proved here. But again, the construction of problem instances that are hard for sum of squares here is an application of the probabilistic method, uh, namely this famous application by Paul Erdős. Um, okay, so the question that inspired this research is sort of what other uh, types of proofs are hard to simulate in the sum of squares proof system. These examples show that the probabilistic method is hard to simulate and also that uh, some type of theorems involving uh, integrality constraints are hard to simulate. Probably I think that it's just fair to say the probabilistic method is just that it's a random instance, but the proof is algebraic. Yeah, well, in both cases, there's a lot of algebra. It's not that the no, but I think the proof, the, the, the proof of the, the, the thing that the SOS proves is the non existence of the solution. Yeah. So that part in both cases is by a union bound uh, argument. <coughs> the proof that random graph has no click. No, 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 but the pierce dimness of the uh, constraint of. Yeah, that, that part. The, the, yeah, the, so that, it's not just a publicity matter. I mean, there has to be a proof at a certain degree. Uh, no, I think I'm in agreement. Uh, yeah. so I'm in agreement with you. Probably what I think is fair to say is that the instances use the, the problem. The, 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 the existence of the instances is proved using the probabilistic oh, method. Uh, I, I, I think I'm in agreement with you, anyhow. Uh, well, okay. Uh, so the, the point of this talk is going to be that. Uh, uh, we're going to take a theorem that is known using the polynomial method and show that that too is hard to prove in the sum of squares proof system. Um, okay, so this is uh, you know, combining these two examples that uh, use the probabilistic method to generates hard instances for sum of squares with, with this one that I'm going to present to you that uses the polynomial method. I think the theme of the talk could roughly be summarized as whatever Noga Alon does when he's proving theorems is hard for the sum of squares proof system. So that's, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> use sum of squares to replace all mathematicians but one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the, the theorem that we're going to uh, uh, capitalize on is Ellenberg and Heiswitz's result uh, using a key lemma of Kroth, Lev, and Pa. Uh, that Set of more than uh, here's how I'm going to write it: uh, epsilon of n times three to the n vectors in f three to the n uh, must contain an affine line. Uh, 
epsilon n is equal to some number that's like 0 .0, 0 0.92 to the n. Okay. Uh, okay, and then the main theorem that I'm presenting here is uh, with Sam Hopkins. Okay, so refuting the existence of a cap set of size greater than uh, epsilon times 3 to the n. Requires uh, some of squares degree. At least a constant times the square root of log of uh, 1 over epsilon, uh, provided that uh, epsilon is not too small. So uh, Square root of a log of one over epsilon should be less than uh, uh, sorry, that's a really obtuse way of writing it. Uh, <laughs> epsilon should be greater than some constant over it. What's the obvious upper bound on the yeah. SOS so degree? The is number of variables is 3 to the n. The number of variables is 3 to the n. Yeah. Yes. So what's the obvious upper bound on the degree? Uh, well, there's an obvious upper bound of 3 to the n. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when epsilon is 1 over n, then Roy Meshulam has a very nice proof <coughs> that uh, using results about the third moment of the Fourier coefficient vector, Okay, so that he has an iterative argument that over the course of one over epsilon iterations derives a contradiction where each iteration involves reasoning about the third moment of a coefficient vector. And I, I haven't checked this carefully, but I think the degree of the proof boosts additively every time you do an iteration. So that would give an upper bound of one over epsilon. So quadratically, exponentially bigger upper bound. Uh, and it would also require epsilon to be bigger than constant over n. Okay, but so that's sort of the realm in which we're playing here. Um, but this is off by an exponential in n factor from the right answer. So this is some kind of hardness of approximation in the sum of squares hierarchy using an explicit example. That's the main reason we think this result is interesting. So in the time of reading, I want to give you some notion of how we proved this. We use... So, Bobby, I could have, would you be able to explain how to express this theorem in sum of squares, or is that too... How to express this theorem in sum of squares? Oh, of course, yes. Uh, uh, so we're going to have variables a sub x for every x in f3 in the end. And uh, we're going to have equations that say that the variables are Boolean. And that the product of three of them is zero whenever they form an affine line. And then we're going to have an equation that says that the sum of all of them is equal to r, and 
try to, okay, a sum of squares proof would derive a contradiction, and you would conclude that that value of r is unattainable. But, but, but didn't you say that it's proving that, you know, it's proving that some of, uh, some, some, some of the ax is equal to r, you know, because the Gregorian result is already hard. Oh. If, r is a, if, if r is not an integer, that's hard. That's right. Uh -huh. So, so yeah, there's a, um, <clears throat> yes, refuting existence of a cap set of size 3 to the n divided by 2 was already known to be hard because it's a half integer. <laughs> but the, <laughs> no, but you see, the thing is that, <laughs> no, but honestly, honestly the, 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 the thing is that this is hardness of approximation. So the, the, the Gregorian result says, well, I know that there's, uh, it's hard to show that there's no cap set of size 3 to the n over 2, but it might be easy to show uh, that there's no cap set of size 4 of 3 to the n over 2. You have more <laughs> equations here, though, so maybe that. Yeah, yeah, that's also okay. You, you have more equations. It might actually be easy. Yeah, in fact, if the sum of squares proof system can refute this for an integer value of r, it can easily refute it for every non integer r greater than that value. Um, you know what I mean? Just, I guess Meshulam's proof is an example where you could have like a non trivial sum of square proof. like. Where, where it, it is a priori could have been possible that you would have like a, a low degree sum of squares proof despite the Gregorian result. You could have like a low degree sum of squares proof for this for a, for an equation of this form for some for yeah. some values. Yes, so so it's not like the result would follow from the Gregorian. Okay, but, but again, like the, the context in which this result is. Not just sort of a boring continuation of the Gregorian train of thought is that if you if, if you want to prove hardness of approximation within the sum of squares hierarchy, that corresponds to finding combinatorial problems whose you know uh, expressed in a maximization form, where we know that the true maximum is something small, and we can't rule out some much higher value in sum of squares. Uh, like the like the maximizing the number of satisfied linear equations mod two example that I had here, where there was about a factor of two gap between uh, what we knew to be the maximum and what sum of squares. Um, okay, so this is getting a super constant gap between what we know to be the maximum and what the sum of squares can prove. Uh, the method of proof. For this and all the other sum of squares and possibility results that I mentioned in this talk, involves constructing something called a pseudo expectation operator. Uh, this is a linear mapping denoted by E tilde. I think the name of the notation might be due to Boas Barak. Uh, anyway, the, the usage of these operators predated the term. Uh, <laughs> okay, it's going to be a mapping from polynomials of degree less than or equal to 2D to real numbers. It's going to satisfy a few properties. Uh, so first of all, did I say it's linear? Yeah. Okay, the pseudo-expected value of 1 is 1. Uh, Pseudo expectation of fi times h is equal to zero for any one of our equations fi and for any polynomial h whose degree is small enough that we are allowed to form the pseudo expectation expression. Uh, and finally, the pseudo-expected value of g squared is greater than or equal to zero for every polynomial g of degree less than or equal to d. So, the reason for this notation is that you should think of this operator uh, as being as if uh, uh, the designer of this linear map is pretending that they have in their head 
a probability distribution over satisfying assignments of these equations. And uh, when asked to apply this linear operator, they take the expected value of the given polynomial under a random sample from that distribution. Except since the operator is not defined on all polynomials, but only on polynomials of bounded degree, it's possible to cheat and act as if you have a distribution in mind, whereas what you really have is only some object representing the first 2D moments of a putative distribution, which may not turn out to be an actual distribution. Okay. Uh, if it were an actual probability distribution over solutions, it would of course satisfy this. It would satisfy that because Fi would evaluate to zero on each and every sample point of the distribution, and it would satisfy this because d squared would evaluate to something non-negative on each and every sample point of the distribution. Um, an observation that's easy to confirm is that if a system of polynomial equations has a degree 2D pseudo-expectation, and it cannot have a degree 2D positive Stellenzatz reputation. Okay, so uh, <coughs> existence of a pseudo expectation of degree 2D implies non existence of. Positive Stellenzatz reputation of degree 2D. The proof is a one liner. If you have 1 plus summation of FIHI plus summation of GJ squared equals 0, if that's your positive Stellenzatz reputation, you apply E tilde to both sides. You get 0 on this side and on the other hand, the axioms for pseudo expectation says that this gives you one, this gives you zero, and that gives you something non-negative. Uh, so the left-hand side is greater than or equal to one contradiction. The converse is also true, by the way. Um, but I won't be using that in this talk. Instead, I'm just going to be directly describing to you a pseudo expectation that manages to fake existence of a large capsule. But you can say that the converse is just a duality of positive uh, semi-definite problem. Uh, better yet, Avi Biggerson can say that the converse is just the duality of semi-definite problem. Uh, OK. So a pseudo-expectation operator for the capset problem uh, first of all, uh, we have these equations that say that each of the variables is idempotent, so I only have to tell you the pseudo expectation on multilinear monomials. Okay, so for uh, <laughs> A sub S. I'm going to define the pseudo expectation of A sub S to be equal to zero if there are any affine dependencies at all among the elements of S. Okay, so this is much stronger than ruling out affine lines. Um, and actually, that's the main weakness of the proof. This is why we lose an exponential relative to, uh, uh, that's why we only prove a log 1 over epsilon, actually, square root of log 1 over epsilon. Lower bound. Um, okay, and if uh, S is independent, uh, pseudo expected value of A sub S is going to be the probability that S is contained in F. Uh, where F is a 
random frame of cardinality 2D. Have finally independent set in a linear subspace uh, of dimension capital D equals three little d squared. but it contains capital S, okay? Uh, what is this probability? Uh, there are three to the capital D points in this linear subspace. Uh, it's a fixed subspace. <laughs> uh, it's a fixed subspace. This probability doesn't depend on the choice of subspace because there's so much symmetry. Um, so, it, 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 I'm great. I mean, I'm, I'm just using this to define a number, so temporarily take any linear subspace of this dimension that contains S, calculate this probability, you get out the pseudo expected value, and then you're allowed to forget which subset, the subspace you were thinking about. But it, you're, you're getting at why this thing. Uh, Sort of satisfies the equations in the definition of pseudo. So uh, let's see, we're going to have to verify that the pseudo expected square of any low degree polynomial is greater than or equal to zero. That's where most of the work is going to be. But for the issue of why does it obey the uh, system of equations that I just erased, uh, well, ax, a, y, a, z is going to be zero because we rule out f by the dependent sets. And the sum of AX equal to R equation is going to be obeyed basically because whenever you try to find a violation of that equation, um, you're only allowed to look at tuples of 2D vectors at a time. And I can always pretend that the random linear subspace that I was thinking of when I defined this uh, pseudo expected value is one that contains the 2D variables that you just asked about in your bundle. Uh, okay, uh, so various things are easy. The pseudo expected value of 1 is 1. Um, the pseudo expected value of ax, ay, az times h is 0 for all h. Um, this one is a little harder, but not that interesting. Uh, but the pseudo expectation manages to fake that the cardinality of the set is R, and here R is equal to uh, 2D times 3 to the minus capital D. Okay, so that's going to be my epsilon from the original theorem statement. So time for size of the uh, oh, uh, yeah, thanks. All right, times 3 to the R. Okay. So in the theorem statement where I express everything in terms of epsilon, this is the epsilon. You, in, you, know, you plug in d equals 3d squared and invert this, and that's where you get the root log 1 over epsilon. Uh, Hard is showing that the pseudo expected value of g squared is greater than or equal to zero for all polynomials g of low degree. So let me just talk about how previous papers have shown this uh, and what we do differently. Um, This statement is an assertion of positive semi-definiteness for a giant matrix of pseudo-expected values of monomials. Mm. 
Okay, so if M is the matrix whose expected value, alpha beta entry is this expectation, then, uh, okay, the pseudo expectation of G squared can be expressed as a kind of and a product, uh, I just did that because I read a blog post by Boaz that says that his eyes glaze over when he sees this notation, so I wanted to put him to sleep. Um, you, take the, you, you take the coefficients of G and you stack them into a big vector, and then you just take the you know, quadratic form of that vector found in this matrix. Uh, okay, that gives you the pseudo expectation of G squared, so we need this matrix to be positive semi-definite. Okay. Uh, in previous, some of squares lower bounds, like Gregorio's lower bound for the knapsack, uh, the way to prove this is to just explicitly find a system of orthogonal polynomials that diagonalizes this matrix. And uh, uh, I think that's also in the Makeup Potential Vigerson paper. Uh, uh, their, well, okay, their, their matrix was sort of a deterministic matrix plus some random noise coming from the random sampling of GN one half. But the, two, the deterministic part of it also diagonalized very nicely in the basis of orthogonal polynomials. And uh, the reason why is that the problem has so much symmetry. Okay, so for the knapsack problem, for example, there's a permutation group that acts on the variables. And uh, the pseudo expectation was defined in a way that respects that symmetry. And that means that it belongs to a very nice ring of matrices called the Johnson scheme, which uh, are simultaneously diagonalizable. Okay. Um, this problem, too, has a lot of symmetry. The affine group acts on F3 to the N transitively. Uh, our pseudo expectation respects that symmetry. And so this matrix, too, uh, commutes with all the matrices in the ring generated by uh, the permutation matrices representing affine transformations of, affine, of F3 to the N. Um, okay, but unlike the Johnson scheme, that's not a commutative ring, so uh, those transformations are not all simultaneously diagonalizable. Instead, what happens is when you change basis into the irreducible representations of the affine group action, you get a bunch of square blocks. Uh, the dimensions of these blocks are the irreducible, are the character degrees of the, uh, uh, sorry, no, it's the multiplicities of the irreducible representations in the affine group action. Uh, okay. And you can, Prove either using character theory or just by directly finding uh, the irreducible representations. Uh, sorry, three to the capital. Uh, there's no representation that occurs with very high multiplicity in here. So the, the square blocks that appear when you diagonalize it this way. Uh, have dimension less than three to the capital D. Okay. Uh, okay. So what happens in our proof of positive semi-definiteness is we don't uh, show that M is a diagonal matrix, but we do show that it's diagonally dominant in a natural basis defined by the um, uh, natural basis obtained by taking a, a basis for each of these invariant subspaces separately. Uh, and yeah, the reason that we're picking a random linear subspace of this dimension is that it means that the original matrix M has diagonal entries that are much larger than the off-diagonal entries. See, a diagonal entry corresponds to the square of monomial, so it's really like I have a set of d uh, points in F3 to the n, the same set repeated. I take their union, so I still have a set of d points. And I'm asking for the probability that that belongs to a random uh, 2D frame in this big dimensional vector space. It's a 
pretty small probability, but it would be much smaller if I had any more than d points in my frame. It would go down by an extra factor of uh, 3 to the capital D every time, I, uh, roughly 3 to the capital D every time I boost the cardinality of that set. Okay. So in the original basis, the monomial basis, the diagonal entries of this matrix are 3 to the capital D times bigger than any of the off diagonals. <coughs> The only trouble is the matrix has so many non-zero entries per row that you can't prove it's diagonally dominant in that matrix. Okay, so the trick is to do a change of basis that gets it to be sparse in each row, and to show that it retains the property that the diagonal entries are much bigger than the off-diagonals. I think that's about as much as I can tell you in the time that I have. Um, this, is, this is a unitary, is that the composition is over the top of the number? Uh, the representation the, theory you use. The, if we actually did it all the way down to the irreducible representations, it might be over the complex numbers. Um, we can do a change of basis over the real numbers that makes the diagonal block small enough. I don't know if these are irreducible, actually. But um, we can find a change of basis over the real numbers that makes the diagonal blocks. Uh, that's not found in their size. Any questions? Any more questions? <coughs> Uh, if, uh, how, how much, uh, how flexible, so suppose I change the equation that uh, the sum of AI is R to the sum of AI is R plus Z square. So this just means that it's at least R. Is it, uh, is it the same still or? Uh, <coughs> so that makes the system potentially easier to satisfy by adding an extra degree of freedom. Uh, therefore, harder to refute. Okay. Uh, okay. So, in particular, if you added that extra degree of freedom, our theorem would still show that there's no low degree refutation because our pseudo expectation would just set every monomial involving Z. Its pseudo expected value is zero. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and on the other hand, it makes the system no easier to satisfy because satisfying it involves actually coming up with a cap set. Sure. And we know you don't have this. Yeah. So it's the same. Yeah. Okay. Uh, technically, it does not affect our proof because we managed to satisfy the equations exactly. I, there might be some range of parameters in which uh, you know uh, this thing with the R becomes refutable, but your thing with the Z is still not refutable. As far I don't know anything that precludes that possibility. Um, I mean, I just want to avoid uh, that nobody will be able to tell you that even if the R is non-integer, then it follows from Grigori. Right? Yes. Yeah. Because it's, it's, uh, yeah, you're, you're asking a question that I actually wish I, I... I think there are people who know more about it than me, so you're just asking the wrong person. Like, I've heard Pravesh Kotari talking about the difference between, uh, uh, you know, having an inequality constraint that some polynomial is greater than or equal to R versus making it into an equation that it's equal to R plus Z squared, and that potentially in some cases the, you know, Complexity of refuting those two could vary according to whether you have the extra variable. But I don't know specifics about when that happens. More questions? Uh, yes. Is this proof similar to the proof for Gregoria proof of Zurex or? Because in that case, there is also a bunch of uh, block diagonal matrix in this expectation. The question is whether the proof is similar to Gregoriev's reputation for the 3XOR. Yeah. Um, I would say there are common themes in all the proofs of doing a change of basis that, uh, yeah, do, doing a change of basis to, to um, Get into a situation where the moment matrix is either diagonal or almost diagonal. Um, the, the one with 3XOR has some extra bells and whistles in it. Because
because uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not having easy. I'm not having an easy time answering this question. Uh, uh, maybe we should just take it offline. Yeah. I guess maybe related to that is is a good way to understand this to say that like some these proofs in the for random constructions had this notion that the matrix is positive semi-definite because it has some dominant component plus other thing that because of randomness uh, they cancel out and they have small spectral norm and now you replace these random things with pseudo-randomness that comes out from this algebraic structure? Uh, I think that's a generous way of putting it. Uh, I'm not sure that I would say this algebraic structure contains any pseudo-randomness. Um, <laughs> Instead, I would say you, you have things like Gregorio's lower bound for the knapsack problem, where uh, there's just a lot of symmetry in the equations. Okay, we're doing another proof in the same spirit. Um, the, the symmetry is sort of non-commutative in a way that introduces new challenges in the proof technique. But, not in a way that I would characterize as pseudo-random. So it's not like a random versus structured kind of thing where you partition the matrix into the dominant part plus an extra part, and you somehow upper yeah. bound the spectral norm of, of the other part by some kind of a pseudo random No, no, no. I wish I could say that it had that interpretation. I think there, 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 uh, there are other questions for which I'd like to prove some squares lower bounds, uh, uh, which might be characterizable in that way. Like a great question, I think, is the, the, what's the clique number of the Paley graph? What can SOS tell us about the clique number of the Paley graph? Um, where it might be profitable to think of it as having a dominant plus a pseudorandom component. But I, I, I wouldn't characterize my own proof that way. OK, so uh, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>